Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Welcome to the Great Women in Compliance Podcast on the Compliance Podcast Network with Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine. Sometimes it seems like it was yesterday and sometimes more than the 18 months or so since we started, but I really remember preparing to do my very first ever podcast recording. It was with Ellen Hunt, who is the Senior Vice President and Audit Audit Ethics and Compliance Officer for AARP. Um, She is also my guest today, and thank you so much. Um, And Here's a little background. There we were on that first day, Mary and I, figuring out the technical aspects of how to do a podcast with the support of Matt Kelly, who is really one of the great men in compliance, and I will, you know, plug radical compliance here right now. And there we were sitting in a conference room in Boston. Mary and I are podcast rookies, and I was definitely nervous. Ellen, that's one of the first times I got to speak with you, and since then, Ellen has become an advocate, mentor, and most important of all, my friend. Um, I've gotten to know you over through professional work and also through just living in D.C., and every time we catch up, I learn something, laugh a little more about the craziness, and appreciate your support even more. So with that in mind, after a couple weeks ago, when I spoke with Gwen Romack about building the Dream Compliance Team, I started thinking about what makes the ideal leader for said team. Ellen, you were the perfect person to join me and talk about this, and thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know you, can you give a little bit of background and talk a little bit about what you do at AARP? So I think that I'm very similar to lots of uh, folks who have ended up uh, in an ethics and compliance role. I was I was drafted. Um, I was working as a lawyer at the time when the company I was with um, pled guilty to a number of counts under the False Claims Act, and they suddenly uh, needed uh, a compliance officer, and they said, hey, Ellen, why don't you do it? Um, and it was really um, a moment of uh, great fortune for me because as much as I enjoyed being a lawyer uh, and the skills that being a lawyer bring to the role, what I like about being an ethics and compliance lawyer is you really help people and the organization solve real problems um, that are very personal uh, and uh, uh, important to them. And so I always describe my job, Lisa, as um, being able uh, to provide uh, people with the ability to make the best ethical decisions. And that's for the organization and the individuals as well. So uh, I have a job description that goes on a couple pages long. That's really in essence is what the job is. Yeah, I think about it that way a lot. Um, and uh, some of that have, has come from you and that there's very clear areas of things that are absolutely wrong. And there are very clear areas of things that are can be absolutely correct. But there's a huge gray area in the middle and how to work and work with teams and businesses is always, you know, organizations. It's just critically important, I think, for what we're trying to do. Yeah, and we always I always strive to get to yes. And um, those conversations, I, I really encourage people to come and talk about the issues. I would much rather be uh, involved from in the front end when people have a question about what they should do than rather in the back end when they've already they've already done something that may not may have crossed the line. Yeah, absolutely. And you're always coming up with new ways to help them get to yes. Um, and every time you seem to have a new innovative tool or project that you're working on. What are you doing right now that or have just completed that is exciting to you? Well, one of the things we did is we internally built a chat bot uh, using some machine learning. Uh, and um, one of the surprises that we take away from that is while the IT team thought that would stop the number of people asking questions, it really hasn't. What it has is created a brand new avenue for people to get information. Um, And it's been wonderful to see the kind of questions people are asking and knowing that they're getting, you know, instant answers. But a couple of the other things that we're working on and focusing on uh, in 2020 is, how how we in our organization are going to govern the use of artificial intelligence, not only our own use of it, but uh, our vendors to make sure that that's aligned, and then also how we're going to audit that that use to make sure uh, there's that alignment. 
We're uh, refining uh, our identification of root cause, and, re and we're exploring using um, um, macro learning, providing training in, in short spurts rather than long 30 to 40 minutes. I think that's actually really exciting to be doing that. I mean, I think that's the way a lot of people are learning and thinking now. I, keep, I think about it as like bursts, but I think yeah. that's great. I can't wait to hear how that goes. Um, yeah, we're excited about it. That's fantastic. Um, and, you know, you just talked about a minute ago about job descriptions that can be three pages long and then the things that you really do. And, and turning to that, there are a lot of you know, different permutations for, I think of it as a leader, but I'm just going to call it a, a CECO, Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer role. You know, you can have audit and then did data privacy. And, you know, generally talk a little bit about your thoughts about, you know, that role and you know, how, how someone should be structuring those roles. I've been in a number of different organizations. And one of the things that I think is key to any effective ethics and compliance program is it has to be tailored to the business. And, and by that, I just don't mean that it incorporates how the business operates, but that it really supports the business strategy and growth. And if, you, if you're not, if those things aren't hand in glove, then your ethics and compliance program is always going to be seen as a, as, as a one-off, as an additional requirement, as an administrative burden. So, so I think that's key. And, and when you think about the structure and the, the role, I think it's the same in that it, it really needs to be tailored to support the business. Um, and I think there are lots of different ways that this can be structured or different roles and responsibilities, but I really go back to the federal sensing guidelines uh, when, you, when you think about this. And, and the key is, do you have the independence? Do you have the right reporting structure? Do you have the resources? Are you getting the tone from the top? And I would say, actually, it's not just tone, it's commitment. Your board and your executives believe in the program, invest in the program, are involved in the program. Uh, and, and then the, you know, well, are you a privacy expert? Are you a data expert? Are you an auditor? Are you those things? Sure, it can be any, any of those. I, I think you know, when you look at other executives, they're always expected to expand their breadth of responsibility, and there isn't any reason that I don't think chief ethics and compliance officers can do the same. They're, they're C-suite level executives, and they understand the strategic imperatives. Um, and when, you, when it comes to risk, which I think goes hand in glove with ethics and compliance, why shouldn't they expand uh, their breadth and their uh, responsibilities in that regard? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, assuming all the things from a, the standpoint you just talked about coming from, you know, the, the tone from the top and the commitment is all there and, you know, you come in or I come in as the chief compliance officer, you know, you also, you're from your experience on both sides of this, you know, what is the board looking for, for from your new uh, CECL from that standpoint? And what, what do you think to, for them to be a, you to be a success going forward? What's your thought on that? Yeah. So I think, I think there's, there's two sides to this coin. And one is um, for whatever reason, you're the new CECO, whether it's a new position or you're replacing somebody else, the organization wanted change and, you have to really listen to folks and see what kind of change they want. Uh, and that's one side of the coin. The other is you have to be careful not to just make change for change's sake. Um, so um, clearly, you know, people have expectations that you're going to make things better, um, but you need to choose, you need to choose wisely. So uh, I think the first 90 days are learning and understanding the business uh, and uh, seeing what really, you know, what, what things do you really not have to do anymore? Uh, it, it, I would focus in the first 90 days on, hmm, are we taking extra steps that provide no value? Are we doing things that are in a way that is time consuming, but administratively burdensome? So I would focus on what, what is it we don't have to do versus what new things we could do. 
And then I think the other thing from the purpose of serving your, your executive team and your board, you really need to do an assessment to see, do they understand what an ethics compliance program is? Do they value it? And what are their expectations for its performance? Uh, and then uh, once you really have a real understanding of where they're from, you may have to do some education um, to understand what an ethics and compliance program is and it isn't, right? An ethics and compliance mm -hmm. program can never guarantee that there will never, ever, ever be any problems, um, but it certainly can work to uh, find and fix. Uh, and, and then I think you've got to weave those expectations uh, into whatever you're uh, initiatives in your programs uh, going forward are going to be. That makes a lot of sense, particularly because the board on some level will have expectations of, of you, but you also want to make sure you start from the beginning, educating them on, you know, what, what is realistic and what you can do and really what are the best things for you to do. At the same time, you're obviously learning about the organization and the people and the business too. So it is always a challenging coming out of the first 90 days in the last year. It's an interesting experience. Yeah, you're juggling you're juggling many things, and you really kind of have to balance um, the need for change and your um, obligation to become knowledgeable about the organization, and then, and then also to to implement some plans for improvement. So then, once you along those same lines, the flip side of it is you have the the board and, or you know CEO and others with expectations. If you're coming in um, and you're, you've got a compliance team that was put together by Gwen and we have our dream team, um, you know, what piece of advice would you have there, um, some best practices? And then I guess the flip side of that is when you see that you have some people that may not be the right fit for the team, you know, how are you handling that, particularly given that you're new to the dynamics of the organization? I think that one of the skills of a good leader is to really foster and sponsor and advocate for their people. Uh, when you have talented professionals who know their job well, your job really isn't to manage them. Your job is to help them strategize, to help remove barriers that are in their way, and to support the work that they're doing. It's, it's a different dynamic. Um, and I think when you really have high-performing organizations or high-performing teams, leaders are not really managing. They're motivating. They're inspiring. They're, they're there to be a, a trusted um, source to listen to ideas and to provide candid uh, and considerate, considerate feedback rather than to be a taskmaster as, did you get this done? Did you get that done? You know, are we on deadline? That kind of stuff. And so, so I think it's a shift. It's a big shift. Uh, and, and once you're really um, leading folks rather than managing them, it's just amazing uh, what they can achieve. What can be some of the pitfalls of this is everybody has their own style and their own um, way they're motivated. And so you really need to learn how your employees um, react to, you know, what motivates them, where are their passions and their interests. So uh, one of the things I've done with, with my staff is ask them for their resume. Uh, and, and I want not, not the resume, just the resume for today, but I want to know the resume in five years. Where do you want to go? What are your career goals? What are your own vision? And then how, how do I help you get there? And how do we help you get there as a team? Um, and sometimes that can, yeah, that can reveal the pitfall that, you know, maybe that people shouldn't be on the team anymore. This isn't where their passions and interests, or even sometimes their real skills lie. Um, and then I think it's really your job to try to help them get, um, get on to their what's next and to help them be successful somewhere else. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I also think, um, you know, with that, I, you taking out of barriers is such a huge thing and, and helping prioritize. I think sometimes, you know, so many things are going on that sometimes a good leader without a checklist that so comes back and says like, look, you should focus on X instead of Y because here's what the big picture is. And it really helps to, to fill in the gaps. And I also think that teams appreciate that as you're talking about, because then you, you get the, the idea of, you know, I am a part of this for the company as a whole and the investment. 
And I also do think, you know, some people really may not be interested ultimately in the current role they have. And to think about it that way, as opposed to, you know, you're, you're struggling or something like that is almost liberating, I think, occasionally. Absolutely. And, and um, uh, Ron Carlucci has a piece, uh, I believe it was part of the Harvard Business Review, where they did a study on what great leaders do um, and, and why sometimes leaders fail. And really what he focuses on understanding the breadth of the organization and building context and making good decisions. And I, I think the, the video is 10 to 15 minutes, but it, it's worth everyone taking a look at because um, sometimes we get very focused on just what's happening in ethics and compliance and we forget the rest of the organization around us. And, and we really need, when we think about best practices, we really need to be strategic and be part of the whole rather than separate. Yeah. No, I agree. I think another thing I think that's interesting, and just along that line, um, is the idea of giving people enough space to make mistakes, obviously not catat- catastrophic mistakes, but the idea that giving people the opportunity to try something with the possibility it may not work and being able, you know, obviously not having permanent you know, huge issues, but giving people that, that sort of freedom, you know, freedom to make a mistake, I think is also really empowering. Um, the idea of, you know, we've got a net for you, but you have a creative idea as opposed to saying, you know, just no, let's think about it, even if you're a little cynical at times, because that gives people the opportunity to, to either achieve something or to learn. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes we get a little hung up on, you know, we have to be perfect because we're ethics and compliance. And just a very short example of this, Lisa, is when we were launching the chat bot, we built a team internally to create for us. Um, it wasn't perfect. And uh, for example, it was answering the question when somebody said, you know, I want to report sexual harassment. It was saying, well, I don't have, sorry, I don't have a body. Oh, <laughs> and you know, it, it, I go kind of go back to that 80, 20 rule, you know? Yeah. Okay. Somebody's going to get a wrong answer, but are we going to not launch the chat box because we've got this one issue that we're, that we're working on fixing. And so I thought, you know, we're going to take that risk. We're going to go ahead and launch it. And if somebody calls and says, look, I got this kind of nonsensical, silly answer from the chat bot, we're going, yeah, we know you did. When we're sorry about that, we're working on fixing it. I mean, we're as human as everybody else. And sometimes I think there's real authentic, you're really being authentic when you admit to folks, hey, we're not perfect either. Sometimes we make mistakes. And yeah, we made a decision to go ahead, even though we knew it wasn't perfect. Because our business folks have to make those decisions too. Um, and I just, I think that it, uh, it shows that, you know, um, we're not expecting 100% perfection from everybody else. And we know we're not perfect either. Yeah. And I mean, I, from leaders I've had, I always appreciate people who are candid that way, but also admit when they're not perfect. It makes it, makes it more relatable and you, it makes you, you know, one feel more comfortable. You know, Absolutely. without somebody who feels like they have to act like everything's perfect all the time. Because, I mean, at least in my world, things are very rarely perfect. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So one other thing, since we are talking about the great women in compliance um, and part of the pon- podcast, is there any other pieces of advice that you would give um, to, for women either in these, this leadership role, in chief role, or the, the more senior roles that you think would be helpful to uh, those of us as our women? Yeah, so there's 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 a couple things. I think sometimes because we're very comfortable uh, with ethics and compliance uh, professionals, you know, we all sing from the from the same songbook. Um, we spend too much time with one another. I would really encourage people to um, kind of alluding back to Ron's uh, study to create breath and connection with those who do things very differently. Uh, than you do. Uh, get to know the CFO, the CEO, the treasurer, the HR person, the chief auditor, whoever it may be, uh, and gain some understanding about what their their goals are and initiatives and what are their priorities. Um, and, and they may be from your company or elsewhere, but um, really, um, you know, expand your horizons <clears throat> because <clears throat> you have some of the same leadership 
characteristics that these these other women do and you you you'll grow professionally and personally but the other thing that I would just mention because I just thought it was um a very insightful piece is uh Richard Casson has just put something out on uh, his, the FCPA blog about you know do we still like compliance officers or do we like them yet and he does a very nice job of kind of pointing out what what people in our organization may feel and think about chief compliance officers and then turning the coin and showing the value that they bring. Uh, and those, those are about leadership characteristics, not just technical skills of exercising the seven elements of the federal sentencing guidelines. So that's, that's a good read and I think a nice grounding uh, point to kind of remind yourself of, of you know, what you do as the chief ethics and compliance officer is really bring value to your organization. And um, you are uh, valued <laughs> and, and appreciated. Uh, and um, it's an important role. And it's a hard job. It's a hard job. Um, so um, I just, I would encourage you to, you know, push, push the envelope, get out, be outside your comfort zone, keep learning, always keep learning about new and different things. Keep on being the great compliance officer that you are. That's true. I, I also like the idea sometimes of trying to connect with people on the things that are in the, their subject area, but also just the other things that we do, as I call it, in real life, because yeah. it you know, comes out to the compliance officers are actually, you know, people too with families and hobbies and events. I think, you know, sometimes people think that the ethics and compliance officer all day is almost like the teacher at school. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, to be more, you know, the, the other things, the fun things you do make you more human. Yeah. And I think, I think the value of connecting with folks when you're not connecting with them around an issue or a concern or having a difficult conversation about ethics or compliance helps build a relationship. You know, that people talk about your, your relationship cap capital and, you know, making deposits and withdrawals. I think in this role, you need to be making lots of deposits well before you need those withdrawals. Um, because when you walk in the room and people already trust you because they know you, that's going to make the job a lot easier. Uh, and that's not, you can't achieve that in every case, of course, but um it's important to have a strong network and, and to connect and uh, realize that, you know, there's lots of connections to ethics and compliance well beyond uh, the walls of the program itself. Yeah, and people definitely are much more, you know, receptive. And, I, and I'm also relating within my first year in a role, having gotten to know them outside problems and a couple people, you know, during a crisis and being able to have that combination of the don't waste a good crisis versus um, you know, the also the getting to know people in real life is really, really helpful. I mean, it's never perfect, but it's always a good thing. So, Ellen, thank you so much. Um, thank you for everything you do for me. It's just a shameless plug. You know, everybody should find themselves and Ellen in their city or somewhere else, um, you know, and for what you do for this community as a whole. It is really an amazing amount of work and very appreciated. Well, my pleasure. And I have to say that I think that the podcast has been really a gift to the compliance community, a great way for people to spend a little time on their Wednesdays, getting some great advice from, from pros in the industry. And uh, it's created a community. And I think that's just wonderful. So congratulations to both you and to Mary. Thanks. And, and we will absolutely take that. But I, you know, I was saying this the other day, it really is, I mean, it's not a, a false humble thing or anything else, but the people that we've ha be, have become a part of this community, women and men have really just enriched, I think my life and Mary's and it's tremendous. So much appreciated. And thank you again, Ellen. And uh, on behalf of Corporate Compliance Insights and the Compliance Podcast Network and Mary and I, thank you for listening to this episode of Great Women in Compliance. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.